All right, hopefully this works. All right, I think we're live, everybody. Good morning. Um, Streamlabs did mess me up this morning with some new settings. They forced me to restart stuff. So um, if you're not seeing or hearing anything on the um, YouTube, please let me know in the chat, guys. Uh, anyway, good morning, everybody. Nice to be back again. We've got another edition of Chromeworks Club coming. Right at, First up, I'm going to um, teach you guys a little bit more about face sensing in Scratch. And then we've got a whole a bunch of other stuff, some game reviews, and um, we're going to meet one of the new members of our community in a little bit as well. But um, I thought I'd get right into a tutorial today for you guys who hopped on to see a little more about face detection. So let's jump right into that. All right. So I'm here on the Scratch home screen. Those of you who haven't seen the new uh, Scratch a laboratories feature. It's right here on the home page. You'll see a block, uh, a little area here that says Introducing Scratch Lab. You've got to click that. You cannot get to these new blocks, as I said last week, from the ordinary programming interface. You get a, got to get into this screen and then scroll down to Face Sensing Blocks, where you can see we have our new block set up, and click on Try It Out. From there, you'll have to click on Try It Out one more time. And then you get loaded into the screen here and you can see that my video camera's up and running and working now and everything's good. Now I've already got a starter project set up uh, on another tab here. So I'm gonna jump to that now. I just wanted to show you guys how to get into that. So I've got a basic project set up here already. I'm gonna walk you through most of the steps involved in getting this Pong game working with head motion controls and stuff. So I've got a starter file here. Well, it's not really a starter file. I've just got some basic shapes here. And you can go ahead and draw these yourself if you're interested in building this project. I have a little dot here that's a target. And that's just going to stick to my nose so that I can, um, so that the paddle will know which direction to point when we're doing stuff. And so that is just going to be floating out here and it's going to constantly stick to my nose as we're going along through here. The paddle by default is facing upwards because that's a direction of zero and we're going to make it tilt sideways like this so that we can use it but we we have to set it upright like this so that the angles work so that we t when we tell it to go to 90 degrees or 95 degrees it'll or whatever angle we want to tilt it to it'll work properly. Um, we've got the ball here, and it's just a basic generic ball. Uh, it's black, and there's not much to it. And then we've got these wall chunks that we've designed. They're, they're going to be cloning themselves. It's just a plain old black block. It needs to be um, about 20 pixels or so in size. Um, and so the side, you might have to play a little bit with the size. If you find these things are cloning and the spacing isn't right, if there's gaps between them, then you may have to increase the size of these. But these are all shapes you should be able to just build yourself. And I certainly would suggest that you guys do, if you want to do something fancier with this, that you can go ahead and remix this game and add your own graphics to it as well. All right, let's have a look at the code here and see what we're doing. So let's start with this target, which we want to stick to our nose, as I said. Um, so... We're gonna grab a green flag from our events here. When green flag clicked, let me blow up the screen a bit for you. And we'll grab a forever as well, because we do wanna be sticking this to my nose constantly throughout the course of the game. And then we're gonna go down to our new blocks, our video sense, or sorry, our face sensing blocks. And we're gonna grab this one here that says go to nose. And as you can see, this little red dot, as soon as I click on this, it'll stick on wherever my nose is. And we can put that inside the forever loop. And you see that it just constantly attaches itself to my nose here. Perfect. All right. Um, now we want to constrain this a little bit so that it doesn't go up too high so that you can't use your nose to smash blocks on the screen, right? So what we're going to do here is grab a little if statement that's going to be checking. So let's go to control, grab an if here. It's going to check what our y variable is. And if we try to get up too high, it's going to stop us here. So the first thing we want to do is take... Um, this sensor and we're actually going to move it down the screen a little bit so it's not actually sticking to my nose it's sticking to a spot below directly below my nose so we're going to go to our motion blocks and we'll grab a change y or a set yeah change y by minus 100 and 
in the if statement here, we're going to say if the y position, so let's grab this little block here that says y position, the bottom of our thing, and we're going to grab an, uh, a greater than sign here as well. So if our y position is greater than minus 100, then we're just going to set it to minus 100 as well. So let me show you what that looks like. We'll set y to minus 100. And so now this dot will go up on the screen, and de but not too high. As you can see, that's the highest it'll get up on the screen no matter what we do. And so we can't use it to bash blocks, but it's still sticking to my nose, as you can see. All right, this is going to be invisible. So we really don't need to see this target. So let's go ahead and grab a looks command and hide it here. I'm surprised that it's not hidden in this other version, but let's um, grab that and drop it down there. All right, so that sync. Hey, what's up? Do we need to hide it or do we need to set the ghost effect? Uh, no, you can just hide it, buddy. All right, that was Thane, of course. We'll be saying hello to our um, to our crowd on Discord a little bit later. I just wanted to get right into this project today. All right, so uh, our dot is doing what we expect it to do. Now we have to slave it to our paddle, basically, so that we can um, move our paddle around based on where our nose is moving on the screen. So let's get over to our paddle, and I'll show you guys what to do with that one. We'll go grab another green flag. And while we're initializing things, let's just set the score to zero here. And we'll grab a forever. I'm going to blow this up a bit too. There we go. And inside here, we're going to tell that paddle, no matter what happens, to point towards the target. So let's point in, or sorry, point towards, and we're going to be pointing at that invisible target. So let's have a look at what we're doing here now. When I click the green flag, you can see that it kind of tilts around to face. It's a little weird right now because our thing is oriented vertically instead of horizontally. So what we can do is tell the thing to turn 90 degrees to the right. And then it should be oriented a little better. Let's have a look at that now. And you can see that it's trying to point. There we go. When I go to the left, it tilts to the left. And as I go to the right here, it starts to tilt to the right just a little bit. Now that's because of the um, the height that it is above. You know, Jeffrey had originally said this to minus 50. I want to see what that looks like. I think maybe that's affecting my ability to control this. Let's change that number in the target to minus 50 and see what that looks like. I think it makes it a little bit more sensitive. All right. Now we're not quite there yet. I can You can tell it looks a little weird right now, right? So um, let's tell it to start moving around now. We're going to tell it to kind of trail a little bit behind us. So we're going to use a multiplication command here to have it always moving a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right to match our movement, but not quite there. So it's going to kind of lag behind a little because it's multiplication. Let me show you how that works. We'll grab a move block in here and we'll tell it to move um, with a multiplication sign. And what do we, we're going to multiply times 0 0.2. Um, yes, Thane? Do you know the y position is better to negative 100? Shouldn't we set that to negative 50 or? Yeah, I, oh, uh, if y position, yeah, you're absolutely correct there, Thane. I changed a bunch of these numbers around and I forgot to change that one. I don't think that affects the game too badly. Yeah, I think we're still okay here. All right, so we're moving something multiplied by 0 0.2. And what we're doing is we're gonna measure the distance between us and the target, that invisible target. And we're gonna keep moving in the direction of the, uh, of the target. And that's gonna slide us to the left or to the right, depending on where our face is. Let me show you what that looks like once I get it in there. So we need a sensing block here that says, we're gonna grab that reporter block that tells us all the important information about other sprites. On the right hand side here, we're gonna say, oh, we're supposed to be on the paddle right now, uh-oh. I started coding the wrong thing. No wonder things are not looking quite what I expected them to. Sorry, so let's get rid of this move block here. Go to nose, change Y, if Y position, 
it's greater than, yeah okay so the only thing i needed to do was go over to the paddle so let me show you guys one more time because i think i i haven't had enough sleep last night obviously and i'm a little bit messed up here so okay this is looking good now now i just i'm going to take this move block and move it over to the paddle we need to start coding there i got flipped over to the wrong sprite and didn't realize it here okay all right so over on the paddle now we're going to tell it so i'm going to actually drop this block up between these two other blocks here i'm going to say move distance to target so let's go again and find the target distance to target oh where is distance to target that's not in that block eh? it's in a different oh oh it's its own block i thought it was in the reporter block but um actually yeah you're right thane it's not in there Okay, distance to target time 0 0.2. So a little bit less than the distance to target. And you can see that the thing, because we've got a multiplier in there, it's sliding, but it's not matching what we're doing, right? It's just kind of lagging a little bit behind us. That makes the game flow feel a little bit better as we're playing it. And the, the last part is we want to be able to control the tilt of this thing using the tilt of our head. So, and that's going to smooth out this weird rotating effect here. So I'm going to tell it to point in a direction. Let's go down to face sensing again. And we haven't used this block yet. Um, point in direction of face tilt. We're going to drop that in there. And you'll see that right away our block is immediately going to settle down. And now we've got a really nice little um, block here that slides left and right. Let me max this screen out to show you guys. Right, left. And it feels like we're controlling it, but it's not slaved to us. It's a little bit behind, which is good because it takes a while for the algorithm to catch up with where our nose is anyway. So this creates more of a natural feel like we're controlling the game. And watch what happens when I tilt my head left, right. And now we're going to be able to, with a little bit of work, be able to aim our balls across the screen by tilting our head, which is pretty awesome. Okay. So we're good to go with this now. And I believe that's the last block. Yeah, there's not too much that we have to do in these ones. The ball needs a little bit more code. And I'm not going to actually do all the code for the wall today because um, it's not part of the game mechanic that I want to show you. But I will give you a preview of what the code looks like inside the wall. Um, by the way, if you guys are interested in downloading this project and running it yourself, you can find the code for it on my website at chromeworks.ca. Right now it's on my um, it's on my live stream page, but after this week it'll be moving over to my lessons page. You'll see a link here that says load the SP3 file. So this is the finished project that I'm building right now. If you want to get into it, you can click on this load. It's a little disorienting. And last minute week I got a little confused when I was showing it to you because when I clicked on it, it tried to open the Google Drive doc. But I don't know if you guys are aware that, uh, that Scratch files are actually um, compressed files. They're zip files that contain a whole bunch of other stuff. We've got the JavaScript file here, plus a whole bunch of graphics, right? So when I click on this, it's trying to tell me the contents of the file, but I'm not really interested in it. I just want to grab the entire zipped file, which is, which is called a .sb3 file. So if I ignore all this stuff and don't get confused by it, like I did last week, and then click on the download link up at the top here, it will actually download an SB3 file. And that, um, let's just save it here. And then when we get back into Scratch again, you'll see that as long as you're inside the, um, the proper area here, the face sensing area, and then go File, Load, and then load that file, you will get this project loaded into there. So if you're looking to uh, find the finished version of this project, just go grab it from my website, and um, then you don't have to worry too much about the code. Okay, so we were gonna, about to start coding the ball here. Let's go ahead and do that right now. So when green flag clicked, let's uh, set a variable. We'll go to our events here. So we're just gonna make this more or less like a pong game. The ball's just gonna bounce off of the uh, bat here. The only complication here is the ball has to know what direction the paddle is tilted in. In normal uh, pong, your paddle's always facing at a 90 degree angle, but in this case it's tilted. So we're gonna have to get it to adjust for whatever tilt our paddle has on it. Let's go ahead and set our uh, speed variable. Set speed to five and that will control the speed of our ball we're going to tell it to show it has to hide later so we have to bring it back up again so that it'll show 
and we'll tell it to go to its start position, which is 0x and somewhere around 120y, which would bring it up kind of uh, well towards the bottom of the screen here. Okay, we're going to tell it to point in a direction 180 so that it's coming straight down off the screen as we start our game. And let's grab it forever here and get its motion going here. So motion, let's tell it to move at the speed of our speed variable. So I'm going to grab the little bubble here that says speed and drop it into this hole. And we're going to grab an if statement here. We're going to tell it if our, um, basically we're going to tell it if it gets past our paddle. If its Y position is too low, then we're just going to do a game over event here. So right away we're going to be checking here to see if our ball has gotten past us. So we need to know if our Y position is less than something. Let's go grab a less than sign. And we'll say if our Y position, which is under our motion blocks at the very bottom here, our Y position, if our y position is less than, um, the number we have here is minus 169, then we can play a sound. So let's go to our sounds command. We just have that video game sounding oop sound here. You guys are familiar with that, I'm sure. And I'm going to turn my volume up a bit here. Okay, so let's go play sound. Oops. We're going to hide the ball at that point. And then we're going to um, just stop. Well, we're going we're gonna to leave the blocks growing and moving around even after we finish the game here, just to give it um, a sense that things are still happening. So what we're going to do is we're just going to stop all of the code inside this ball so that the ball's not working anymore. I'm going to grab this stop all, and I'm going to change it to stop other scripts and this sprite. And I'm also going to stop this script. So this is just going to stop all the scripts that relate to the ball. And you can see here that our ball's working now, though we can't actually collide with it. All right, so our ball's going down properly, and when it hits the bottom of the screen, we're doomed. That's good. And right at the bottom here, we're going to tell it um, that if it hits a edge, we should bounce. So if it hits one of the other walls other than the bottom one, we'll tell it to bounce. That's outside of our if statement, but still inside the forever here, just like that. All right, so now it should bounce off the walls when we tell it to. All right, and... We're going to grab a second green flag to get the um, to get the bouncing off the paddle going here. So let's go grab another green flag and another forever and an if statement inside that forever if. And I'm going to say if touching paddle. So let's go to our sensing blocks, grab a touching paddle. If I'm touching the paddle, now here's where a little bit of math comes in. We have to find the normal or the direction that our paddle is facing. And then we have to subtract that, or so we have to find the direction the ball is moving, and we have to subtract it from the direction that the, that the paddle is. So whatever the direction that the paddle is, is going to be the new up for this. And it's going to go 180 degrees from whatever the direction is we're facing right now. Um, well, not 180 degrees. We're going to measure the angle that the ball comes in at, and we're going to do it um, off the other one in the opposite direction basically but based on the angle so the steeper the angle that it comes in the steeper the angle that it goes out um that all sounds a little confusing but let me show you what it looks like in the code here so we'll tell it to point in direction and inside there we need to figure out the direction so actually we needed a couple of minus signs here let's start by putting some minus signs in there two of them and then another minus sign so we're going to say 180, which is the opposite direction the ball's going, minus the direction that the ball's already going in. So we're going to grab a block here that says direction from the bottom of our motion blocks. And we're also going to, we're going to subtract the number of degrees that our paddle is tilting over. So we need a, a sensing block here. We're going to grab that reporter block. We're going to change this to say paddle. And we'll say the direction of the paddle. So this thing is reporting back to us what angle our paddle's at. If I start the game here, you can see that this is reporting back a 164 when I'm tilted this way. And it's reporting a minus 164 when I tilt back that way. And so it's going to keep track of that direction. So we're going to go 180 minus direction minus direction of the paddle. 
and that should bounce it back in a way that basically reflect is, is a reflection of the way that it goes in so if it goes in this let me maximize this if it goes in this way at a very steep angle it's the math is going to make it come back out again at a very steep angle as well i believe all right let's test this out and see how it bounces well that's still not working what else is going on here um hey good morning how are you is that um who was that deck yeah hi deck point in direction 180 minus direction minus direction of paddle this code all looks good if touching paddle so why didn't it bounce off the paddle i wonder let's look at that one more time so that's going through hold it if oh yeah hold it if touching paddle point in direction and then change speed so this should be all the code that's necessary it's inside of forever green flag let me see if there's some other code here that's well this is very peculiar so i'm trying to figure out what i'm doing wrong here i'm looking at the code if touching paddle point in direction 180 minus direction minus direction of paddle that's exactly the code we're supposed to have here and it absolutely should be working if touching do i have multiple paddle sprites here i do not Is that right back checking your other yeah i just i don't oh so i'm in the ball well the paddle is just a solid object so whatever happens in here shouldn't make any difference I, if touching paddle i don't know if anyone if you guys out there on discord have any thoughts on why this isn't working because the code looks perfect to me here making it turn around yes yeah uh point in direction 180 minus direction minus direction of paddle that is absolutely the code can i, turn around and have it can I turn around what uh, huh let me try a different degree in here i'm just kind of curious about what it looks it looks like if we put a zero in here it still isn't going to bounce oh and now it's bouncing So, so somehow I got my directions turned around here, eh? Did I, I told my paddle to turn, oh, I told it to turn right 90 degrees and apparently turning left 90 degrees is what we're supposed to do here. And I guess that makes a difference. It's all flipped around because of that. All right, that's making a little more sense now. Sorry about that, guys. I think this will work now when I go back to 180. There we go, we're bouncing now. And let's try it at a higher tilt. Whoop. Let's try tilting it that way. I still don't see it really going off on strange angles here, eh? Okay, there's a little bit more code to add here. I just wanna see what that's doing. All right. Oh, there's just a, yeah, the, the direction should more or less be working now, so I don't find that I really have the kind of control over this that I think I should be having right now. Huh. Let's go have a look at the uh, finished version of the game and see if that's any different here. And... I must look really goofy tilting my head like this. I think this has to do with the distance from the paddle. I think I started messing with Jeffrey's numbers here and and somehow I've messed this up. I want to try a different number in the target here again. Let's try minus 100 again. Minus 100, minus 100. Sorry guys, I'm just having a little bit of difficulty figuring this out today. There's a bit of weird math in here that's not making sense to me. 
all right, well, the paddle's working. I just don't feel like the direction's working the way that I expect it to. Yeah, these numbers are a bit weird as well. I'm going to stick with minus 50. Okay, I'm going to get back to you guys um, next week, probably with a fix to this, because I think the directions aren't quite working the way that I expect them to, but um, this will work for now anyway. Okay, so the last things we have to code into our ball here are... Let me get my finished project up here so that I can refer to it again. R, um, I just want to change the speed of the ball here. So we're going to go to our control blocks or variable blocks here. And every time we hit this ball, we're going to change the speed by 0 0.1. So the game is just constantly going to get a little bit faster and a little bit harder. And we also want to play a star sound effect here. Uh, let's just start a sound called boing. And that'll just give us a little bit of audio feedback when we hit. Boing. There we go. Boing. All right, good. All right, so the last step here is to get these um, walls growing. There's some really interesting code that uh, we have here for this. I'm not going to code all of this because I think it would just take too much of our live stream up. So if you're interested in um, in having a look at this, please download the file. And I'm just gonna walk, or you can freeze frame on this. I'm gonna show it a little bit at a time here and kind of explain how this works, guys, rather than coding it all bit by bit, because we'd be here another half hour doing this, and I just don't think it's worth the, the uh, time right now. So what this script does is it takes these little blocks. Let me show you one of these blocks that are set up at the top here. And it starts cloning them basically on a random. So the first thing that it does with this script here is it's, is it's um, basically constantly moving them back and forth. There's some multiplication in here, as you can see, which means that these guys are going to be 25 apart. I believe that this wall block is about 25 pixels in size. And so we're picking a random number from minus 9 to plus 9, which means that, uh, and then multiplying it by 25. So at the far left, you're going to get to 9 times, minus 9 times 25, which is 225, which is basically all the way over to the left. And it's just going to move in increments of 25, depending on what random number you picked. So there's basically 18 different slots this thing could hold. And it's going to go through all of these different slots randomly. And every once in a while, it's going to create a clone. So as it's jumping back and forth, let me show you what that looks like, actually. So I'm going to get rid of the hide block here so that you can actually see what this looks like. So it's just constantly cycling through these different possible locations that it could be at across the top of the screen. And every once in a while, if it picks a random number from 1 to 10, and it picks a one, it's going to make a clone, and then it's going to pause for a little bit, and then it's going to start moving around again. So we're, we're basically trying to figure out which of these guys is going to grow a little bit longer, and they're going to start adding pieces down below them, essentially. Okay, so that's the first thing, is just picking where the clone is going to be created. Here's the second block uh, here that's a when I started the clone. So when these guys are created, um, right away we're checking to see if they're touching a ball, and uh, if they do touch the ball, they'll fall into this state called wall falling, where they're just going to start tumbling down off the screen. But right now, they're just glued onto the screen, so that wall falling variable is at zero. We're going to tell them to point towards the ball. And I realized I don't think we need this wall to direction ball. I'm going to get rid of this block here because it doesn't actually do anything in the code. I was looking earlier, and it turns out it doesn't do anything. Okay, so all we're doing here is storing, we're pointing the um, block in the direction of the ball, and then we're, we're storing its location, its x, y coordinate, and storing into a variable here called wall hit x and wall hit y. And um, what that's going to do is broadcast a message that's going to transmit these variables over to this event here called when I receive wall hit. And this wall hit thing is going to basically, um, because it's a when I receive block, all the clones will receive it. It's a little bit like a when I um, when I started the clone block. These receive blocks work the same way. And it's going to check and see whether um, whether the guy is in th that's hit. So it's going to look at basically all the clones are going to ask themselves this, this question. Am I in the same X position or am I in the same row as the guy that just got hit? 
that's the wall hit X. And also it's checking to see, am I below or above the block that got hit? And the, the reason for that is if, if we hit a block way up here and there's a chain of blocks down here, it will knock all of them loose. So all the blocks below that position are gonna end up falling essentially. So if our Y position is greater than it, which means it's below the wall, or not greater than, sorry, so it's, so if it's not greater than the Y position, which means that the, it's a, um, below that uh, block that's been activated, then all those blocks are gonna fall. You're gonna be able to make a whole chain of blocks fall, basically. And what's gonna happen, we're gonna change our score by one, and then we'll start this event here called wall falling. So wall falling is equal to one, and you'll see back in our main block here, we have something here that says if wall falling is equal to one. So as soon as that block gets hit, all the blocks that are below it are all gonna follow this one style here. So we're gonna set the rotation style to all around so they can start spinning. We're gonna tell them to point in a random direction. And then we're just gonna start them spinning and disappearing. So you can see the ghost effect is increasing here. Um, so they start falling and spinning. And then when they get to a Y position below minus 30, which is around here on the screen, then past our paddle, then they're gonna to start to fade away with a ghost effect. And when they get to the bottom of the screen, we're just gonna delete them. So um, they're gonna fall for a little bit, then start fading and falling and then they're gonna delete themselves. Now this last block of code is gonna be the hardest for you guys to wrap your head around. There's some weird stuff happening here. And this is the, the logic that is making the balls attach, uh, the blocks attach new blocks to themselves. What it's basically doing, let me walk you through it here. So when I started the clone, we're telling you guys not to rotate so that they're firmly going left and right. We're telling that variable wall falling to go to zero. And we're making sure that they're not ghosted and that they're visible. Now inside here, so normally if wall fall, well this, this is an if else statement. Oh no, so the if else statement is inside there. So if wall falling is equal to zero, which means that they're not falling, then what they're gonna do is shrink themselves down to size of to 20%. Um, and then move down the screen. They're, they're not, you're not gonna see anything moving because all of this movement stuff, you can see all the change Y's and stuff happening here. None of them count until the very end, basically. Once, so we're gonna move some stuff back. We're gonna do some sensing and then we're gonna move it uh, to its original location again. So none of the blocks will appear to be moving, but we're quickly going to be making them shrink so that we can see if they're overlapping with it, with each other at that point. Um, the way this logic is set up here, and it's a little difficult to explain, but um, the all these guys are gonna basically change their Y by minus 10, which means they're gonna move down a little bit, then they're gonna shrink themselves, and then they're gonna basically roll this dice here, pick a random number, and see whether they're not touching another one of the blocks. Because they've been shrunk, um, they they will not touch each other um, under, hold it. So if this random thing happens and they're not touching the black, that will tell them that there is room for them to continue growing underneath here, basically, I believe. And so it's gonna tell it to grab another block and add it down below if it picks a random number. Now, um, this not touching here is making sure that it's not a block that's in the middle. It has to be a block that's at the end of the loop. And this logic, by shrinking the thing and checking what it's touching, is basically gonna be able to determine whether there's a stack of blocks here, whether it's at the bottom or whether it's at the middle. And it's only gonna grow if it's on the bottom. Now it's a little bit confusing guys, but um, but if you enter this code here, the, everything will kind of flop around and detect itself. So this isn't part of the main tutorial. It's just kind of a cool little bit of logic we've created here to have these guys dropping. Let me show you what that looks like when I, when I start the code up here. It should all be connected now. And there's one other, no, we looked at this code already. So I think you've seen all the code here. As I said, if you wanna grab the finished code for this, just go ahead and pull that off my website. So let me show you what that looks like. Oh, so you can see that I haven't hidden the block at the top here. I had it uh, visible at the beginning, but I'm gonna hide it now. So now it's starting to add blocks down there and every once in a while it adds some length you can see. So I'm gonna try and hit one of these guys a little higher up on the thing and you'll see that 
when it hits the here it goes one that hit, when it hits the top all the blocks that are below it fall as well the logic is really elegant for this and i and very impressive of jeffrey to come up with this but um it's not very intuitive and so i'm having a hard time explaining it to you because the logic that he's using here shrinking these blocks and then moving them around on the screen um is a little difficult to convey to you guys but uh, the the point of this the sort of tldr for this is is this logic in here will check to see whether a block is at the bottom of a stack or whether it's in the middle of a stack and it will only work and create clones if it's at the bottom of a stack it'll add a new block to the bottom of that stack so experiment with this and uh, see if you can figure it out um but i'm i don't think i want to explain it any further here today anyway so this is a really good example guys of um the kind of game that you can make using these blocks now the logic of these walls isn't really that important you could do a breakout game this way you could do some kind of a pvp game this way i guess against an opponent where an opponent was moving and shooting at you and you were trying to move and shoot and the idea is i wanted to show you guys how to uh, make a game where you're controlling it using these face sensing blocks unfortunately i can't share this game in the normal scratch interface because um as you guys know these new uh, temporary blocks are, uh, that in the scratch laboratories area are, are being beta tested which means you're not going to get access to them um inside the normal sharing thing i i I'm, it looks like these blocks are working great and i'm pretty sure that the scratch team at some point is going to jump in and um and dr drag these blocks into the main area but f uh, so that all of us can use them in our own projects but for now we are stuck Anyway, that's our tutorial for today. Um, let's go back to the live stream and see who's on with us today. Mr. T? Yes, Thane. I made a remix of the game. You did already? Good. What did you, how did, what did you change in it, Thane? I changed the ball and the paddle art. Okay, good. All right. Well, um, yeah, uh, I'm going to show some remixes of this next week. So, um, if you just want to like okay. email me the file or something like that, then I'll load it up and um, and I'll show it. See what else you can do to it to, to doctor it up because you probably didn't spend too much time working on it. Anyway, Thane's with us this morning from Florida. Good morning, Thane. So uh, you're already hard at work on this stuff. Are you, Have you been playing with these new blocks at all, Thane? Not really. Not really. I think they're super cool. I've just been playing around with them. I was in a classroom yeah, this week. Yeah, they're really cool. It's just that. I have other stuff to do. Yeah. Anyway, so that uh, I'm I'm just really excited about these blocks, and I've been using them in the classroom this week as well because mm -hmm. I just think that um, it's the kind of thing that kids. Even I was working with some kids who hadn't even tried Scratch before, and within five minutes, I already had them playing around with these blocks. It's it's all it takes is really a forever loop, and you've got these things working beautifully, and uh, they're a lot of fun to play with. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Uh, it's not just me here. Yeah, I get it. So uh, who else is with us? Uh, let's go to the top of the list. Chris Copeman's here from London. Good morning, Chris. How are you today? Hello. Hi. How are things in England today? Are you guys back in lockdown again, I heard? Um, no, the school, the primary schools are open. Oh, okay. So you're and still going to school. school. Okay, so you're still going to school then, do they? Good, yeah. good. Yeah, we're, we're going back on the 8th of March. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're uh, we're back in school here as well. I was in a classroom pretty well all this week teaching uh, cat and mouse. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, I'm also joined here by Gamer Davey from Ottawa. Hi, Davey. How are you today? Hi. Hi. So, uh, I, Davey, I fully expect some kind of a Nintendo remix of this Pong game. Uh, don't let me down, buddy. <laughs> All right. Kean's here as well. Good morning, Kean the Awesome from Ottawa. How are you today, Kean? Kean? Kean. Oh. Hello. Hi, Hi Kean. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. Are you uh are you doing okay in in school with uh now that you're you're back in class again, aren't you, buddy? Yeah. Yeah. You enjoying being back in school again? Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. All right, and I haven't said hello. To... Yeah, and I haven't said hello to my friend Deck yet either. Hello, Deck in England again. Hi, Deck. 
Deck can't hear you. He's on deaf. Oh, Deck, Deck is deaf. He must be over on YouTube. Anyway, pop in and say hello if you can. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to introduce you to... Deck. Oh. That's the man. He said he's very busy. I think he just doesn't hear it. He said he's very busy, so... It's all good. So he's on the stream, but not listening to it. That That's really handy. All right. Congratulations, Deck, on <laughs> on being here, but not listening. That's like most of my students in class. All right. And last but not least, I wanted to introduce you to a new member of our community. Cannon is, uh, who I've just met this week, is from Oregon. He's 14 years old and he is an amazing scratcher. Um, say hi to the crowd, Cannon, if you're listening. Oh, hello. Hi, Cannon. So nice to uh, to hear have you on the stream today. So um, you've been doing scratch forever, right? How, when did you get started on this, buddy? Uh, I started it around three years ago on my old account, and ever since then I've loved it. Yeah, you do a lot of projects. This week alone, I saw you do like three or four different um, pen-related projects, and we're going to go into a little bit of detail on this uh, in a future live stream. I think we're going to do a little tutorial here, but I just wanted to show uh, the group some of the really amazing scratch art you've been creating here. And let me switch over to it right now. So tell us a little bit about these projects, Ken, and I'm kind of interested in um, in how you got the idea to do these really cool pen projects. I'm going to start by showing your pen flower project here. So I decided to uh, work on a little pen because that's not my strong point in Scratch. Mm -hmm. And watched a few tutorials around, and then I decided to just come up with a pen engine to make shapes and other creations. Yeah, so I, th I think we're going to be showing this pen. I think we're going to be showing this pen engine um, on one of our future live streams. So did you grab this engine by yourself or did you um, or did you make it up on your own or did you uh, grab it from somebody else? Uh, I made it up on my own. Oh, cool. And so you can uh, scratch it. OK, so you can see this all. So this is all using the same engine. Here's another one. So just some really cool looking art. This one's called Fire, right? And so these are just uh, taking the same projects and just changing the variables around a little bit. Is that, am I understanding this correctly? Yeah, and you can make your own projects with changing the numbers and variables. Right, this one is super cool looking as well. So it's kind of rotating around a circle here and they're taking turns going to the middle four at a time. Just very hypnotic, like a clock, eh? Wow, very cool. So I, I'm really, I'm really surprised that these are all basically working off of the same math. I, I had a look inside and looked at your variables, and you're just using the same three or four variables and the same coding logic over and over again, but getting very dramatically different results. This is my favorite one too. This, this, I think you said this one was your favorite too, eh? Very cool, very cool. Anyway, so Canon's been making some amazing projects. Um, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna also show off your uh, zombie project. I think too. Eh? Would you like to uh, give us a little description of this one? This is your piece de resistance, right? Your 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 best game. Do you think this is your best work, buddy? Uh, so I decided to. Well, this is based off of a real game on Scratch. This looks a little like Fortnite, right? Or like um, uh, maybe like PUBG, I guess, right? Is that the idea? Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. So uh, basically, it's a real online game on, on like a different platform, but it's pretty much a remake of Alan Scratch, and it's got about 3,000 blocks of code on Scratch. Holy cow, so you can grab objects here. So this is multiplayer, meaning other people can get on the game with me as well, is that right? Or... Uh, and you can battle each other with the items collected in the houses, and I'm actually going to go online and uh, see how that works. Yeah, so, so why don't you get in here right now, and we'll see if we can get working on this. This is really cool. I haven't seen very many implementations of multiplayer that have really worked very well. So you're you're able to jump in right now. Yeah. If any, so I'm gonna I'm gonna save the um, the, I'm gonna save the location into the the chat here. I'll do it in um, 
over on YouTube as well. Oh, that's Mr. T. Is where you do it on Discord. Yeah, I've already done it on Discord here. So it's in it's in um, Ask Mr. T on Discord. And I've uh, pasted into the chat here on YouTube as well. So let's see if anyone can join me in this game. I'm really curious because I have not seen a lot of good implementations of multiplayer. As I said, I'm going to run around here and see if I can find a weapon. Oh, we got some people three landing. Now. There you go. We got three players going in this game. Wow. Okay, somebody go find a gun. Oh, four players. Awesome. All right. It's a free for all now, guys. Where's all the weapons? They're inside buildings, I guess. Uh, they're in the houses. Yeah, okay, let's go inside the house here. I oh, here's a crate. Well, this is impressive, Ken, and I have to say, um, what what advice would you give to anyone who is trying to um, create a multiplayer game? Are there tutorials or anything that we can use? Oh, I got me a shotgun. Excellent. Let's see how that works. Oh, all right. Yeah. See you later, dude. I don't know who I'm. Who am I shooting at? Okay. I don't know how many hit points you have, but I hit you a million times here. Well, this is actually really cool. I haven't seen a lot of good uh, multiplayer games. So sorry, um, Canon, I was asking you about tutorials and things to get started in multiplayer gaming. Um, is Did you kind of come up with this on your own or did you grab somebody else's engine here? Uh, I used all this by myself. All of this. So you made up your own multiplayer engine just using cloud variables, eh? Wow. Really impressive work. I just want to show you guys a little bit of the inside of the code here. Just to give uh, you a sense. Uh, Which one? The next one to the right. Uh, the guy. The spot that says guy. This is the most impressive one, eh? Let's have a look in here. So let's have a look at all. Whoa. Whoa. So it took you months to put this together. Holy cow. Yeah, that's a ton of code here. Really impressive work, my friend. I have not seen very many good implementations of multiplayer. So this is fantastic. Wow. Really nicely done. So complex. I don't even want to begin to look at this code. I'm getting a headache just looking at it. Um, anyway, um, Canon, really uh, nice to have you in the community. I think you probably have a lot to teach our uh, our friends here, and um, I know uh, a lot of the kids are very excited to have you here. So, um, so welcome, welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, anybody else? So, if you're on YouTube, oh, we do have someone on YouTube. Um, so, La Bata del Night Corps is here. Welcome. Uh, I arrived to see the game with face detection, and you might have arrived too late for that. I put that at the beginning of the tutorial, so if you missed it, then um, you might have to uh, check in again after the stream's over, my friend. Uh, anyone else who's on the YouTube chat, please uh, check in with me, and I'll give you a little shout-out on the stream. All right, anyway, as I was saying, this week I was over at uh, back in school again. I was at a school named Roberta Bondar Public School, named after one of our famous Canadian astronauts. And I was teaching a grade seven, eight class there, or actually six different grade seven, eight classes. I taught them my introductory scratch uh, curriculum called Cat and Mouse, which you can get to from my website by going to chromeworks.ca cat and mouse or you can click on the cat and mouse link here on my web page and this is my introductory coding curriculum that um, that is great for all beginner users and it just takes you through building a game and learning all about the most important aspects of scratch like uh, conditional statements variables cloning all the cool stuff you need to know to be able to get going let me show you a little um, compilation of some of the cat and mouse projects and remixes that were made by the bondar group this week <laughs> This week, Chromeworks visited Roberta Bondar Public School in Gloucester, where six different grade 7 8 classes learned coding using Chromeworks' cat and mouse curriculum. As always, our students found all kinds of creative ways to put their own spin on their first scratch project. Here's a sample of their work.
find out more about our free coding program for elementary school students, visit us at chromeworks.ca slash cat and mouse. Go. Okay. Anyway, guys, I I um see you around, Davy. Um, there's a so there's a new platformer called Doom Dungeon here that um that that our reviewer Yaya has reviewed this week, and I'm actually really impressed with it. So let's have a look. Hey everybody, I'm Yaya Abdullahi back with another Scratch Game Review. This week's game review will be on Doom Dungeon 2 games by Coder underscore D6. Coder has created and coded many other cool games like Space Fill Games and Fruit Night Games. Coder has an art account called art underscore D6 where he posts art that you can use for your games. Doom Dungeon 2 games is a little fun game that will make your mind explode. The whole objective of the game is to make it to the purple portal as fast as you can. It's about beating the levels and seeing your timing. If you beat the top 3 world records, your name is going to be on the bottom whenever someone is playing that exact same level. I must say, I almost made it in the top 3 but I was off 1-2 to two seconds. I'm still trying my hardest to make my name go to the world record. The game has 7 levels which you can choose which one you can play first. There's a funky cool music to the game as well. In the menu when you're choosing between the levels and when you play a level, there's also a different music. The controls of the game are WASD and Spacebar. The spacebar is to push some stick around on the ground so you can make it to the passage to the portal. That will end the game and show you time. I have a challenge for everyone who's watching this. Can you make it to the top 3 world records? Can't wait to see. Don't forget to subscribe. All right, that's a cool game. I'm gonna leave the um, the URL for that in the file description for this. I really like the water effects. I don't know if you guys noticed the water effects at the bottom of the screen. I haven't seen water done quite like that in a scratch project. So uh, that's one well worth trying. All right, um, we have a longer music tutorial. So rather than giving it to you guys right now, I've released it as a separate project. It's gonna be released a little later today, but I've asked Ishan, our music uh, composer, to come up with a little kind of trailer for it, just a little less than one minute trailer. So let me show you that right now. This week on Ishan's Music Camp, we'll be learning how to make a simple one octave piano on scratch. We'll be learning how to use the drawing tools on Scratch to make your own keys and design your piano. We'll be learning how to create sound and how to pick what notes to play using Scratch's original music blocks. And we'll be learning how to create shortcuts so that you could even use your keyboard to play. Check out our YouTube channel Chromeworks Technology for the full tutorial and more amazing Scratch lessons.
right, thanks for that, Ishan. So that uh, and all our other Scratch projects are available, of course, over on our website. We're gonna have lots of content from for you here, but I wanna remind you guys that I have a lessons page here on my website that has all of our big major projects that we're releasing every week. I think I've got over 50 projects here now. So lots of video tutorials for you. And we're gonna be releasing more. Our co-op crews busy at work with making all sorts of cool projects. So please subscribe if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Scratch and we're gonna have new tutorials for you every week. Um, I think we're pretty much ready to wrap it up for today. I really appreciate all you guys for coming aboard. Um, and I'd love to see you again next week when we'll be coming back with... I'm not even sure what we're doing next week. I'll probably do a little bit more face detection next week. And we're working on a couple of new projects. And it's just a matter of seeing which one's um, done first. But um, stay tuned. And um, I will be posting online on my live stream page late next week to tell you guys what we're going to be working on this week. Um, in the meantime, I really thank you guys for logging in and 